Need to create a complex enterprise Angular application? Angular Bootcamp is an intensive three-day workshop class to learn the basics of Angular through sophisticated techniques for real-world applications. We target Angular 6 and the recent versions with much of the curriculum is suitable back to Angular 2. Or go beyond the three-day class with a consultation or project launch with Oasis Digital, the team behind Angular Bootcamp. We can assist your team or launch your project with advanced Angular topics including scalability, data flow, state management, full stack product design, and more. Contact us for a private class at your location or buy a ticket for public classes in various cities around the U.S. and occasionally in Europe. Online live instructor training is also available at angularbootcamp.com. Welcome back, everybody, to Adventures in Angular. This week, our topic is zones. <laughs> and we have on our co-host this week, Joe Eames. Hey, everybody. Aaron Frost. Hello. And our guest, Gia Lee. Hi, everyone. And I'm John Papa. And this week, let's just dive right in and first ask the question, G. What is Zones? I mean, what is this thing? Yeah, Zone is a library and developed about four years ago. And it is a JavaScript library which is inspired by the Dart language. And it is an execution context in a simple word. Yeah. Hmm. Execution context. Can we, you like dive a little bit into what you really mean by execution context? Yeah, for example, in a JavaScript function call, we have an execution context. You can access, access this and to access the, the context of, of this function. But if you have some a synchronized uh, function call, such as set timeout, set interval, or promise, you will lose the context unless you record this you name it into that or self or something like that and keep it into your uh, set timeout callback. Unless you do that, you will lose the context. You don't know which function the set timeout was scheduled. So Zone.js provides a way to keep the context in all the synchronized operations in JavaScript engine. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. And uh, I know it's big in Angular. And I know that. Uh, you know, not, not a lot of Angular developers know about it because yeah. we, we it kind of just kind of takes care of itself unless you've done something wrong. Yeah. But it, it sounds like maybe you've done some new stuff in zones. Like maybe there's something new in zones that we're here to talk about or something. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I began to uh, contribute to ZoneJS about two years ago. And at first, I, it, it, it wasn't an Angular project. We use zones in a Node.js server project to handle the the concurrent request or something like that. And after that, about one year ago, I began to, I first know that ZoomJS is also used in Angular. And yeah, I, I currently I basically take care of everything about the ZoomJS. And I would like to share some new features uh, of Zoom today. Yeah. And cool. about like where is Zones used in Angular for those who may not know? Because I think as Aaron oh, yeah, said, sure. A lot of people yeah, use sure. this, but they don't know where it is. Yeah, sure. And ZoneJS in Angular basically used in uh, four, four, uh, four parts. The first one is the, uh, maybe everyone has used that, is ng-zone. It's used to uh, the change detection. And uh, it will tell you when to start a, a tick, when to start a change detection. So if you have a, a sync operations, Synchronized operations such as time, set timeout, and after the set time, timeout call, it will automatically check whether Angular needs to run a new change detection or not. And that is the fu fundamental part. And the second one is a test, and we use the, the zone to uh, monkey patch the Jasmine. And when you run a, a Jasmine test, you know, describe it. It is in a zone, in a sync, uh, sync test zone. And if you use the fake sync or a sync test, it will be the fake sync test zone and the sync a sync test zone. It can help you to automatically done the adjustment test after all the synchronized tasks are finished. And if you use the fake sync test uh, zone, and it will help you to run a synchronized test just like a synchronized one. So uh, in test uh, Angular test. It uses Zoom everywhere, 
And the third one is the error handling. And in Zoom, it has a very elegant way to handle errors occurs in the uh, asynchronous function. And uh, it is uh, very difficult to handle error handling, uh, which occurs in the asynchronous calls, especially uh, those asynchronous uh, operations occurs in some third party uh, libraries. But with Zoom, we have a very elegant way to handle error in a uh, single uh, position. You can just handle the error in a global position in the ng-zone. And the, the final part is the debug and the tracing. And we have, when you run uh, ng-serve in development mode, you will see a long, a long stack trace. And I think uh, very few developers use that, the uh, web tracing framework. And in fact, the zone.js also support it. And if you uh, run ng zone inside a, a wipe trace framework zone, you will see all the uh, scope, uh, everything, uh, enter scope, existing scope. You can trace and uh, uh, tuning the performance in the zone. So, yeah. What, what's this framework you're talking about? Wire trace? Wi wipe tra wi WTF, a uh, wipe tracing framework. All right. Can you get a link and post it in the in the chat so that we can share it with the listeners? Because I okay, want to check sure. that out. Okay. Because like everyone else um, that uses that, like most people, yeah. when I get an error in Angular, I yeah. just get a never-ending call stack full of, like the very first call is a zone. Yeah. And I get uh, 85,000 RxJS calls. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, then, yeah. Then my, my code's in there. So yeah. if, there's, if there's some way to make sense of that, that'd be great. Yeah, about 98% yeah. of the call stack when I get errors, and this isn't just Angular, it's pretty much every client-side framework, it feels like 98% of that call stack is completely useless to me. Uh, don't you think so, guys? Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, 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 yes. 100%, 110%. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, the, in fact, there, there is a feature in Zone to, to remove all the uh, Zone-related error stacks and if you import a zone error, it is a standalone package which is provided by zone. And uh, in, in that package, it has two features. One is it will automatically remove all zone related uh, stack trees such as zone invoke and zone delegate, something like that. And it, it doesn't make sense to most of the developers. Mm -hmm. And there is another feature of the zone error, which is, and in JavaScript, if you uh, inherit an uh, error, for example, you have your own error type. My error extends error. And mm -hmm. if you knew a my error, an instance of my error, it will always return false uh, because the weird, uh, uh, the, the error is, it, it's a little special in JavaScript. So the zone wow. error also resolves that problem too. Oh, nice. Yeah. So one of the, kind of going back to John's question, yeah. Is known. Um, I, I've only had to run into it a few times, like yeah. uh, buggering with zones in Angular. And yeah. one time in one of my classes, yeah. outside of the class, just at the top of the file, I made a new behavior subject. Okay. And that behavior subject got created before the zone was created. And so okay. any, anything I did with that behavior subject was outside of Angular zone. Okay, and I, and I couldn't figure out what was going on, why my behavior subject wasn't in the zone. And so, as soon as I stuck that behavior subject instantiation inside okay. one of the classes, okay, everything was taken care of. But yeah, like that was for me kind of an eye opening of what is the zone doing? It's taking care of all. It's taking yeah. care. You kind of monkey patch everything asynchronous in the browser, right? Like set timeout, yeah. XHR requests. What yeah. else? Yeah. What else gets monkey patched by zones? Yeah, basically, all uh, I will see uh, most asynchronized uh, uh, operation was on monkey pad by zone for the uh, macro tax. Uh, uh, macro tax is the set timeout, set interval, and uh, uh, SML HTTP request. And some uh, there is a document there, and uh, mute, uh, for the macro task, it is promise and the muta mutation observer. Fail, uh, uh, macro tasks also include the file reader and the the, the canvas, uh, the block, uh, the to block, for example, 
and there are a lot of new API was supported uh, recently. And for the event event listener, for all, uh, for example, on click and add event listener was also a monkey patch by Zoom. So basically, every uh, asynchronous operation was monkey patch by Zoom. Hmm. Yeah, recently uh, there are a lot of new API, uh, especially in the Chrome. Uh, for example, the resize observer, uh, it is also a monkey patch by Zoom. And yes, in, in uh, outside of browser, uh, for example, in Node.js or Electron, uh, there are also a phone, phone gap code over, and the API, uh, we are adding the support uh, to monkey patch those APIs too. Yeah. Gotcha. For those of the people out there who probably don't know what the word monkey patch means, it's one of those things we use quite a bit in this industry. Uh, to one of you want to kind of describe what that means for folks, or because we use it a lot. Yeah, yes. The the big uh, for the Zoom JS basically what what it does is monkey patch all the global API. Uh, the monkey patch means we just overwrite the behavior of the the global API. For example, set timeout. Uh, if we call set timeout uh, without the Zoom JS monkey patching, it will directly call the native delegate of the. Uh, the, the browser provided the functionality. With Zoom support, what, what it does is it will keep a native delegate of the, for example, the set timeout, and it will uh, override it. Uh, in the overriding, what it does is it will use Zoom to trigger several hooks before calling the real delegate. The first one is schedule. That means when you call Zoom monkey patch set timeout, it will not directly call the native delegate. It will call a hook, the hook named uh, on schedule task. That means we will have a macro task being scheduled uh, in this zone. And after that, we will call set timeout. And the set timeout will be scheduled in the browser's uh, the, uh, in the browser stack and in the uh, browser queue. And when the browser, the timer, for example, one second after one second, it will be pushed to a, a callback queue there. And when the, the callback of the set timeout uh, go into the main stack, and another uh, hook of the zone will be invoked, which named on invoke task. And zone provides several uh, hooks to let the uh, developer to monitor when and what happened of the async operations. Uh, the most used is on schedule task, on invoke task, on handle error, on has task. And, and that, there's a lot of them, but th those four is the most used, especially in Angular. So the developer can know what when and what happened of the asynchronized operations. And for example, a set timeout has scheduled in, in my zone. So the zone knows, oh, there is a macro task was scheduled. And when the uh, callback of the set timeout was invoked, uh, the, the zone knows, oh, the macro task has been invoked and it is gone. So I am stable. I have no pending macro tasks. And if there is some errors, there is also a trigger, a hook to tell the zone there is some something uh, error happens in this zone. So the monkey patch will provide all those hooks functionalities and for to let the outside developer to monitor the asynchronous operations. Gotcha. Yeah. So uh, as best as you can, I know it's super, super intricate. What are yeah. what are the new things you've done? Because I know that zones have been around yeah. for a long time. I mean yeah. we we heard a talk in 2014 about zones. Yeah. So I know that you've done some stuff recently new. What are you yeah. doing differently with zones? What's new? Yeah, uh, the first one is uh, a big part is about performance. And we all know that Zone.js, uh, I, ju uh, I just said it basically a monkey patch all a synchronized API, but sometimes you don't want some API be, being mo monkey patched. Uh, the most uh, request is, for example, the request animation frame, and you, you just don't want to use Zone to monkey patch it because in the callback of the request animation frame, you just want to move the div, some static, static stuff, nothing uh, uh, 
related to the uh, the data binding or something like that. You don't need the, the, the chain detection. So there is some flag. The flag is documented in the uh, currently in the Angular CRA generated poly, polyfill.ts. And you, if you set set that flag to, to true and that special uh, uh, specified module will not be in the zone. It will just use the native API. And that is one big part. So now it's only it's modulized. All the API is modulized. You can load a specified module you want. That that is one uh, big part about performance. Hmm. As uh, one more example is the on uh, the event handler. Uh, for example, the on scroll, on mouse move, uh, on, on mouse in or out. The event like that. A lot of requests uh, they want they don't want those events be monkey-packed by zone uh, either. So uh, there is another uh, global uh, variable flag. If you set that flag, everything will outside the zone. Uh, for those events, uh, the mouse over and the mouse move, uh, scroll, on scroll, something like that. You can disable the zone patching uh, for, for the module or for some specified events. And uh, in fact, uh, zone.js keep uh, keep the uh, native delegate inside of the zone. So if you, in some special case, you just want to use a native API, you can. And there is a, a the way to do that. Uh, it is also doc documented. Uh, I will post it later. You, you can also call native de uh, delegate directly. I'm, I'm looking through your, your talk on this because you share some slides and we agree yeah, we can yeah. include this in our show notes as well, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, it's interesting. I didn't know about some of these hooks. So being a indirect user of zones a lot using Angular, I know not yeah. about zones to be dangerous. <laughs> yeah. and looking at some of these, like I knew about the on intercept lifecycle authenticated error. I knew how it helped you with handling errors and a couple okay. of tasks. But I didn't okay. realize there were so many ways to work with the task. So it looks like there's yeah. on schedule task, on invoke, on camp. Yeah, yeah. As yeah. I'm curious. Without getting the technical details of what each of these does, what kind of interesting things have you done with zones uh, as an Angular developer? Mostly it's in the, in the test. And with the, for, for example, uh, we can use the uh, on has task uh, or on schedule task to monitor, monitor the performance or monitor how many, how many pending tasks I have left. Uh, in, in fact, uh, there is a, a new feature in the test test the library to tell you, uh, for example, in the fake sync test, there is some pending uh, micro task not finished. And if you do, not, do nothing, it will just left there. Maybe there is a bug, but with on has task, you can just know. And there is, a, a, there is some pending things not finished. You need to tick or, or do something like that to finish it. So it's, and, that sounds like a lot of that is uh, task tracing, right? Yes, yes, yes. And the performance tuning. And you can, yeah, you can know, for, for example, user click a button and it, inside the button click even handler, there's a lot of uh, different uh, sync uh, operations. Inside a, a sync operation callbacks, there is another sync operations. You want to know exactly how, how many performance costs in each of these steps. You can just use the zone and calculate the time between the on uh, before the on invoke task uh, and uh, calculate the performance uh, after the on invoke task. You will know exactly each task cost uh, how many times. It sounds like from what you said here in this scenario, and then earlier we talked about kind of when and what zones is good for. Yeah. Um, I think what I'm hearing from you, and tell me if I'm wrong, is you would use zones or you'd recommend using zones for testing, debugging, yeah. measuring performance. But yeah. what you're not saying, and I want to kind of take a leap, is yeah. it sounds like you're saying you sh probably shouldn't or maybe it's not as useful to tap into zones for your actual Angular development or like release code. And if that's, so do you like use zones for re every day regular development that you release, um, not yeah. debugging and testing? And if you do, what do you use it for? Yeah, in Angular uh, application, I didn't use uh, my special uh, special zone instead of ng zone in the application part in the application business logic part i just use it uh, my 
own zone to handle like tracing debug and testing. And I, I did use uh, my own zone uh, in my first project uh, of Node.js to handle, uh, this is not Angular, but I use it to handle the a concurrent request, the log and the journey, some, some kind of a AOP stuff in the Node.js Node server side. But in Angular, basically, ng-zone has uh, handled everything, error handling, change detection. So I, I didn't find a, a use case to use that. Maybe so, uh, so there mostly is, for debugging, yeah. fine tuning, performance. I'm not saying those aren't valuable. Those are probably the most yeah. important parts of development, to be honest. Yeah, uh, yeah. But yeah, that's what I was kind of gathering. So for everyday development, it sounds like Zones does yeah. what you need out of the box for regular. Yes, production. yes. Gotcha. Yes. Yeah. So I've got some questions. Um, and as you went through and kind of detailed sure. yeah. um, the new stuff, one of yeah. the things you mentioned was that you improved some performance. So yeah. from what I understand, Zones doesn't have uh, that, that much of a footprint at runtime. Like it's pretty lightweight. So when yeah. you say you improve performance, like how much are we talking about? Like are we talking about 20%? Are we talking about 5%? Like what, what, what kind of improvement did you make? Okay. Um, mostly it's about the, uh, the memory, I think, uh, especially in the uh, uh, either even the listener. Uh -huh. uh, before the performance tuning, it, uh, there, is a, there is a lot of the garbage collection occurs. If you have some uh, big grid, it will register a lot of even the listener. Uh, into the Angular, uh, into the DOM, and after the performance tuning, we 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 only use one global uh, callback listener. So currently, the garbage collection was decreased very uh, uh, very greatly, and I think most about the perform performance about the memory and about the time. Basically, it it will reduce about fifty percent time when you call set amount. But that, that is not a big number because, because the set amount itself doesn't cost a lot of time. And the native one, it, uh, it is uh, maybe uh, a small number. And if you use the Zongji as a patching one, it is uh, some uh, overhead at about uh, 40 or 50% uh, time uh, in impact. But it is not that much. Uh, compared to all the uh, application, yeah. Okay. Hi, this is Charles Maxwood, and I've been asked more times than I can count, how do I stay current? There's a lot to this question, and I'm working on a solution, code badges. That's right, you heard me right. Basically, the idea is, is that you come and do a code badge, and that gets you an introduction to a topic. Then you can decide if you want to pursue it further. But while working on the badge, you gain enough proficiency to be able to pick it up again if you need. A lot of technology comes through on the bleeding edge, and not all of it sticks, but the principles do. So doing badges on the technologies that will get you ahead will provide you with experience needed to stay competitive. Plus, it offers social proof that you know something about the topic. The project is on Kickstarter right now. You can support it and get on the launch list at codebadge.org. It's going to help with some garbage collection, it sounds like. And it's going to yeah. help with the runtime memory footprint that Angular has. Sounds yes. like. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, that's good. That's good to know. That's cool that you can optimize such a small library like Zones and get get that kind of benefit out of Angular. That's cool. Yes, I think yeah. Uh, another mo uh, big impact is about something like the request animation frames. It will just not run in the chain detection at all. Yeah, that that is a big part. But the time cost is not by zone. It it, it is on the chain detection part. It just ignore that. So. Hmm. And. Uh, some other features include some uh, promise uh, enhancement, and now uh, uh, zone uh, monkey pack promise too. So we have a zone aware promise in Angular. Everybody used uh, the promise used is in fact the zone aware promise, a zone implement uh, implemented promise, and uh, we have uh, make the zone aware promise pass the promise A plus test. Now is it is a full spec promise. And it recently, it supports the uh, promise, uh, promise finally. Um, and it also support, uh, officially support the Bluebird. And uh, you can use Bluebird as the uh, you know, uh, underlying promise implementation and use ZoomJS as a wrapper 
to make Bluebird Promise also in the zone. And oh, cool. in the early, it is not supported. So all the Bluebird extra method spread or something like that, we are also in the zone. Cool. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, one thing uh, I mentioned earlier is about the zone error. You can remove all the uh, uh, stack. It is very helpful when you development. And yeah, and we and ZoneJS now also support Electron. And because Electron is run in the Node.js and the browser, and Zone has a, a, a bundle. Uh, but when we use Angular, it will load the ZoneJS slash this slash ZoneJS. It, is a, it can be only used in browser. And if you have some Node.js project, it will, it will load Zone uh, uh, hive uh, node uh, dot js. It, it can only work in Node.js, but we in the Electron, we have a new bundle named Zone Mix. It will monkey patch both browser and Node.js, so it can be used in Electron. Gotcha. Yeah. And we have a lot of new API support, media query notification, RTC peer connection, something like that, Socket.io, all those new API uh, brought in the new browser are supported in ZoneJS too. And the mo most uh, thing, uh, new things happened in Zone is about the test. There is a lot of new feature in the testing and I also uh, working on the documentation in the Angular testing, uh, uh, the, uh, the markdown file. Uh, several are merged, several are still under review. There are a lot of new features in the fake, fake sync test and the sync test. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, fake sync test will can support the, the date, the date now. And uh, for example, okay. we have a start time is date now and we take maybe uh, a second and we we record the end date and we use end to minus start, start. We expect it should be one second, but in the early version, it is not. So currently, uh, the uh, fake sync will work perfectly with the date now. So mm. if you take one second, the minus, the difference will just be one second. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's nice. That's a nice feature to add back in. Yeah. So uh, the, the similar, uh, the date now is supported. And the other thing is the Jasmine clock. Uh, it is similar with the, the now uh, Jasmine clock. We are also supported with the fake sync. And there is a feature, but maybe uh, I, I talked with some people in the uh, Angular team. They said maybe uh, we will just ignore that. That is, if you use Jasmine clock install and the test, you don't need to write fake sync it will automatically go into the fake sync uh, zone. But the Angular team said, maybe just let the user to know they are exactly what they are exactly using. So it is a feature uh, controlled by a flag. You can use it or not uh, based on your uh, case. And the date now, just me clock, uh, another is the RxJS scheduler. So the RxJS delay, ASAP a sync uh, will also work inside fake sync. When you delay one second, you take one second. It will it will also work. So uh, um, yeah. So I'm looking at your test. There's a lot of tests in this repo. Um, yeah. There's a lot. Um, and I, I hear you mention things like RX. I hear you mention things like Jasmine, Electron. The zones generally work out of the box or do you guys have to go and add support for a lot of different things like and 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 what's the criteria for what you guys add support to like like i guess electron finally yeah. you guys like yeah let's add support for electron what yeah. and like bluebirds made it onto the list somehow too so what are okay. what, what 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 what's the criteria that says hey let's add support into zones for this thing yeah basically uh, at first uh because i'm gonna use jasmine for example as the test framework. So ZoneJS will support Jasmine. And basically it's based on the developer's request. And in, in some times, uh, people also want to uh, add the support for Mocha, for example. And Zone just support Mocha, monkey patch Mocha 
also to support mocha tests. And for okay. the actual, yeah, basically based on the user's request. Gotcha. Is there a way that like, so let's, let's use this example. Let's say that there's a, the Jest team, right? Let's say, okay. let's say we wanted the Jest guys to have access okay. to zones. Is there a way to make zone, like a zone API so that the Jest team can add support or can only the zones team add support for zones? Like, I guess it is zones extended a little where yeah. other, other projects could add support zone support to their projects without the need of the zone JS team. Yeah, other team uh currently uh, other team can add the uh support for their own library. But uh, those APIs they, they are public but they are not well documented yet. So they they can but it's a little difficult for them to without some uh, good document. And uh, for but uh, for for the for the Jazz framework you mentioned, uh, we are adding support to Jazz uh, currently. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right, that's good. This is all way too over my head to offer okay. to help write documentation. But yeah. is there any plan to get those documents going? Yeah, uh, I'm working on that, and uh, currently I'm uh, documenting on the uh, testing part for the Angular, and after that I will document the you know the zone its own API. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, cool. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I want to ask an opposite question. Yeah, sure. I see a lot of, if you Google this, and I, and I recommend our readers, our viewers, listeners, <laughs> uh, okay. try this. Google this. Google what the heck is zones? And <laughs> you'll find okay. a lot of really interesting articles out there where people are asking these questions. And I think you're yeah. doing a good job explaining kind of what it is and what it does and how it works. Yeah. Uh, one of the interesting things I like to ask about is an opposite side of the question. What would happen to Angular if you removed Zones.js? And then I have some follow-ups on that. Yeah. Uh, it, in fact, uh, yes. Currently, Zone uh, Angular has support the noob zone. You can just remove Zones.js at all and handle when to a trigger change section just by yourself. I think in the next Angular IV, it may be the default way to do the change detection, maybe. Yeah, you can you can do it, it now, I, I think. Yeah, because yeah. out, out of the box, I mean, it's really, and there's, it's a little deeper than this, right? But zones is effectively kind of how the change detection all works sweetly in Angular yeah. these days, right? Um, yeah. It's not entirely true, but, you know, without getting into the details. Yeah. If you remove zones.js, which I've seen some people recommend doing, and, and I'm, and I don't know the ending answer to this, but let's say remove zones.js from Angular because you don't necessarily need the change detection. You're just putting up some things and you're going to uh, yeah. manually trigger those changes yeah. yourself, yeah. like you just mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. What is the advantage of that? Is Why would somebody remove zones? Is it heavy? Is it big? Is it slow? I mean, this is something I don't understand is why somebody would even want to remove zones. Yes, uh, from uh, the Mishko and the Rob said, basically re removing zone, the most biggest uh, request is about Angular elements. Because uh, uh, in the Angular elements, if you load Zone.js, because Angular elements is only a small part of the whole web page, and Zone.js monkey patch everything, uh, global APIs. So if you load Zone.js, the first thing, it, it is a uh, 12K, uh, so it is a little heavy if you run a very small Angular element. Angular may, may be 5K, but Zone.js is 12K, it is not reasonable. Uh, the other thing is Zone.js monkey patch everything. So it may impact outside of, outside of the Angular elements. For example, there is a React or jQuery outside the Angular elements. It has some impact of the others. So it is not good for the Angular elements. And in fact, the, the, currently it is not released, but we are working on that to make impact at less as possible to not impact outside the world, to let Zone.js only live inside Angular elements. We are working on that, but it is under review and not released. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. yeah, so for me, I've never removed zones and I, I hadn't thought about it, but you're right, it makes a little bit of sense, I guess, in the Angular element side because, yeah. Yeah. you know, it's really just a, an island of Angular amidst a bunch of other things in the page, right? Yeah, so in the normal Angular application, I think with Zone.js, 
there is not a lot of performance impact or the bundle size impact. I think use ZoomJS is just most comfortable comfortable way to for developers. Only in the Angular element, I think it is a very making sense use case. Yeah. Hmm. That's interesting. That's okay. good to know. Yes, and sure. And yes, uh, back, back to the new features, we have some better uh, uh, error message. If you run a just in test, it just came out. And currently, in the new version of ZoomJS, it will tell you which task is pending. The task name, for example, set timeout, an argument, uh, the callback argument, uh, and the delay time. It will help you to find out uh, the exactly uh, the the not finishing task uh, more easily. And the other big big thing is uh, the ZoomJS has supported Jasmine three and the Mocha five. So Angular can also use the Jasmine three, uh, the new version of the Jasmine and the Mocha. And there is something uh, under development. And not but not finished. It is in my slides. Uh, the request is from the Blash of RHS team. Uh, he want uh, he want to use ZoomJS as um, a standard a standalone library just for testing. So what his requirement is to unify the Jasmine Mocha and the Jazz API into a single library. So in one uh, test case. He can use the Jasmine API. He can use the Jazz API. He can use the Mocha API. He can write whatever he wants to write. So if he can use the uh, Jasmine before all, uh, he can use the Mocha uh, it, it dot skip. He can use the Jazz it dot only, and he can use the uh, the three library expect uh, or mock uh, or spy. So uh, one developer, he can write uh, the test case with his uh, comfortable and favorite test library. So th this one is under development. And yeah, uh, it will be released uh, based on the, the Blash review. And, and it may be used in the new version, the next, maybe next, next version of RGS2. Yeah. And the other thing uh, is a uh, talk about is uh, the Angular elements and the uh, ZoomJS currently support the custom element V1 spec uh, recently, so it will have a better support. In, in, in fact, there is several issues about Angular elements working with Zoom. For example, if we uh, generate the Angular element or set the input, update the input outside of the Zoom. The Angular element will not render correctly. So uh, currently, we have some better support of the Angular element, and we are also adding support to let ZoomJS only uh, rendable inside the Angular elements now. Yes. Um, gotcha. And another big thing, uh, it, this is uh, in, in fact a very big issue has haunted me about maybe one and a half year. <laughs> uh, it is about the uh, native. Yes, uh, 2017, the native async await. And mm. currently, we can't compile uh, Angular application in the ES uh, 2017 because the native async await will not monkey patched by Zoom. It just used the browser native promise, we will not use the JavaScript promise. Uh. So this, is a, this issue has been discussed. discussed uh, in several teams, the Chrome, Chrome team, Node.js team, uh, 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 several teams, there is no uh, very elegant solution. We, need, we may need the promise hook or something like that, that uh, natively supported to monkey parse it, that. And uh, recently, we, we found a way to uh, work around, maybe workable. We, 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 we did a, I, I did an, I did a lot of test cases about it. Maybe there are uh, a solution to work around that so we can handle the async weight just like the normal promise to keep the zone, the context, even when using a weight. Well, I I'm going to tell you, Jia, uh, the day that you realize that you have something that haunts you about JavaScript is the day that you discover, yeah. this is for anybody, that you are a real developer. 
<laughs> we all have something that, that that makes us dream nightmares or just yeah, like, yeah. Like JavaScript that we shouldn't be. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I have yeah tried a lot of ways to implement that. Yeah, I'm also going to put some uh, links in the show notes about NG Zone and places in the docs that we can and link people to as well. But uh, yeah. We're about time to wrap up here, and wanted yeah, to sure. let you know that we we do picks on the show, and basically okay. throw out picks. They can be technical or just things that are your favorite things you want to share with everybody. Uh, and we'll start. Give you time to think about that, and we'll start off with Aaron. Is your job search stuck? Maybe you're not getting any interviews with employers, or maybe you are, but no job offers. Or you may be new and not even know where to start. This is Charles Maxwood, and I'm releasing a new course and ebook on how to find a job as a software developer. The course walks you through the process of finding the types of companies you want to work for, getting their attention, and putting your best foot forward as the candidate they want. I've coached dozens of developers in looking for jobs and have been able to help several people find jobs within two weeks to two months. So whether you're new to development, can't find a great job that fits what you want, or are looking for remote work from an area without a strong tech community, I can help. Go to getacoderjob.com and sign up today. What are you? Yeah. So I have a pick today. Um, there's a book. It's, it's a bestseller right now. It's called Educated. Now, um, this book, it's not the most like action-packed story I've ever read. And it is, it is nonfiction. But um, I've never read a book where um, I had more like WTF moments um, listening to this, this story. It's a story about a girl. It's her biography. And she tells her her story about growing up in the backwoods in in Idaho, and it's it's just it's insane. Her her parents were like these weird snake oil people, and oh my gosh, like it was just it's just really really interesting um, the things that would happen, and they wouldn't you know call doctors or send their kids to school. It was just, and then she grew up and realized what school was all about, and she got educated. And um, she realized, you know, how the how the world really was. And so, um, I like every every thirty seconds, I just would be paused, and I just go, I'd have an audible hmm moment where I just couldn't believe what what was happening to this kid. So, it's a it's a really really good book. It's called Educated. So, if anyone's looking for for a book, that that's a good one. And that's my pick. Awesome. Thanks, Aaron. Joe, what's your pick? All right, so I um, want to pick a podcast, sorry, a blog that I just recently read. And um, I can't remember if I picked this this last week, but it was so interesting. It's called The Developer Experience Bait and Switch. And it's basically a blog post about how um, the JavaScript that we write, the quantities of JavaScript that we're putting out right now, they are just so high and so uh, intense. So it kind of talks about um, the fact that if you put so much JavaScript in, you're limiting the number of people that can... We, it's kind of something we already know, but as the internet expands, there's more Android devices that are lower end that are getting on the internet. There's more bad bandwidth uh, connections that are coming out on the internet or getting access to the internet. And so all of these things mean that these huge quantities of JavaScript and what we are accepting today as a reasonable amount of JavaScript is actually much too big. And again, he, cons- he compares the JavaScript to like, like CO2. Really interesting concept, very thought-provoking, something that everybody should uh, read. And of course, Aaron and I have been recording D&D, so look for a link there to some of our recordings of the sessions we've been having with some of our friends playing Dungeons & Dragons. Dude, it's so fun. And yeah. we, do, we do some of the stupidest things. <laughs> <laughs> that was so f- it is. It's really hilarious. This week, I Leroy Jenkins and got, got us all almost killed. Yep. It was pretty awesome. So, yeah, it was fun. <laughs> Those all are right. Picks. Thanks, Joe. Uh, I have a couple of picks here, too. One is one I just ran across today. Somebody that I only know through the internet, which is a lot of people these days. Uh, but I, I love the stuff that she writes. Sarah, I believe her last name is pronounced Vieira. And I'll put her link in here on Twitter. She's uh, Nikita FTW on Twitter, and she just blogged this topic, The Dark Side of Conferences by Sarah Vieira on Medium. And 
it's a really good post. I read it earlier today, and it talks about her experience at conferences and things that uh, she enjoys and things that maybe give her a little bit of, um, I don't know, awkward feelings. And, I'll, and when I was reading through this, I could totally relate. For example, when I go to conferences, I love talking to people. I love engaging with them. Uh, for example, the NGConf, I do it all day at Aaron and Joe's conference, and it's, it's amazing. But I need my alone time to recharge. I can't be that person who's there from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., and then goes out to dinner and then goes out to a party and then goes out to the after party and actually is functional. It's just not in me. I need a little alone time to recharge the batteries and go back. Uh, and I don't drink. And I feel a lot of times at conferences, uh, if you don't drink, you're kind of, you know, what's wrong with you? And it's this inner introspection feelings that I have. Uh, and then back to Sarah's post, she, had, she writes about some of the things of how she feels. And I think it's really awesome that she did this and it actually inspired me to talk more about uh, some blog posts that I've been carving out to talk about how to engage the people at conferences without feeling that pressure of having to be out there every single social event because you don't live life like that. Like when you're at home, do you do that? Do you like party all day long and all night? Um, I don't anymore. Anyway, Sarah Vieira, check it out. Uh, I thought this post was amazing and very inspiring. And then the second thing is I have a new podcast I'm announcing. Uh, it's called Real Talk JavaScript. And Ward Bell and I, who Ward's a co-host on here, and Dan Walleen is are also going to be on it. We're going to be hosting this show. And the twist is, you know, everything, ah, another JavaScript podcast. But our twist is this. We're inviting people on who've built real production systems in, with JavaScript or with something revolving around that ecosystem and HTML and CSS. And we really want to ask them, you know, what went well, what didn't go well, share with us your, your development stories, uh, what things did you wish you knew before you started. And I just think these things are fascinating. The more I listen to these amazing JavaScript developers out there in the industry, and I believe that it might be interesting to other people too. So check us out. We launch October 2nd. We'll be every Tuesday morning. And I'll still be doing these podcasts. But uh, we're doing that one in addition to it, and it's every Tuesday morning, and it's Real Talk JavaScript. Uh, you can find it on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, um, pretty much anywhere you want, even in your refrigerator. So that's my picks. Joe, I think we should make Fake Talk JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> fake talk, I like it. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about something you've never actually done. That well, yeah, work. we'll get someone named <laughs> Wandaline and... Pon Joppa and we'll Pony Joppa. Pony Joppa and and Joe Eames and Aaron Frost and we'll just fake talk JavaScript. Your name doesn't work like that. Farron or Rost. It doesn't. I can't do that. Yeah. Gia, do you have any picks? Yeah, the, the first two things jump in my head is uh the books I read, maybe I I, I read two months, I will read them again. The first book is maybe everyone knows is you don't know JS. And yeah, I, I read that book uh, several times every two months. Uh, it, it answers a lot of questions about uh, how the JavaScript engine works and why they are designed, uh, designed in that way. And I think it, it is great for you know, to, to know the, uh, how, how the inside work and a lot of details, and a lot of uh, uh, you're, you're not o o often use API. Uh, it, it is great for me to understand uh, all the JavaScript things. And that's Kyle other, Simpson's book. That's uh, the yeah. book by Kyle Simpson. You don't know JavaScript? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. The other one is is an Angular book. It is a very old book by Minko, and the switch to Angular two. It is very old, very very old book, and the content is also very very old. Uh, not covered some new features and uh, 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 from the Angular 4. But I think the organization of that book, the content of that book, is the most clear, uh, clear book I have read about Angular. M maybe even better than the Angular IO, I think, maybe. Some, some of the content. Yes, uh, that, that is, the I, I think, maybe the best book I read about Angular. So I often read that book, review, uh, reread that book every maybe two months to clear my head to, to understand how I'm going to work again. 
I, I think the, uh, that is a very, very great book. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. So I guess that's uh, that's all. So come back next week for our next episode. And uh, Gia, thanks for thanks for coming on this week, man. Thank Have you. Me. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good time learning about all the stuff you've been working on. Thanks for doing all your yes. hard work. Yeah, Thank thanks. you. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.